Gaia Gear is a very obscure not Gundam story written by Yoshiyuki Tomino in the late 80s, right around the same time he was writing Hathaway's Flash and before he decided to try and establish a new Gundam continuity inside the same Universal Century with Formula 91 and Victory. That new era didn't work exactly as he hoped and many years later he expanded even more the Universal Century continuity with Turn A Gundam and even later with G Reco. But a lot of things happened from F91 to Turn A Gundam as the Gundam franchise expanded to new alternate continuities with G Fighter and Gundam Wing and many more that came later. And also G Savior happened, but it was weird, not so relevant and even worse Tomino was not at all involved with the film. All of that happened in the 90s, but we can say that Tomino's original vision for the UC was developed in the late 80s, with Char's counterattack being the climax and two stories spinning out from that conflict. The fate of Hathaway as the last new type who had direct contact with Char and Amuro and was influenced by both as told in Hathaway's Flash, and also a very strange story happening a hundred years after Hathaway's Flash, a tale about a Franchi Char, a memory clone of Char born on Earth who was destined to lead the new rebel organization that's opposing a cruel and supremacist sub-faction of the Earth Federation who is doing all kinds of nasty things with the Earth citizens. And you may be thinking, hey Absa, why do you say that this story is strange? Everything you have said sounds very much Gundam-like. And yeah, you are right, the strange part comes from the fact that this story, while written by Tomino, was not done with Sunrise. That's why we don't have mobile suits but man machines and we don't have a Gundam but a Gaia gear. It's almost like a fan fiction written by the original author, making it informal and non-canon but not entirely unofficial it's uh, weird. To make matters even more complicated, Gaia Gear even had a 26 episode audio drama adaptation complete with opening, ending and an original soundtrack with sound effects. So yeah, it's weird. Many years later, after Sunrise and Domino made peace with each other, the author was approached by publishers to reissue the novels in audio drama, but he refused because of the quality whatever that means. Well, what it actually means is that to this day Gaia Gear exists in the minds of a lot of Gundam fans but more like a curiosity and weird alternate story with Char as a protagonist and super strange mecha designs. But since it hasn't been officially translated nor the audio drama has been completely uploaded with correct subtitling, the overall story is not so well understood. We only have mistranslated, incomplete and or very rushed summary of the whole plot. And I'll be honest, after I read the summary and listened to the whole audio drama, the story is a little bit underwhelming. Fellow Gundam fan BJ from Sionic Scanlations captured my exact feelings in a very short tweet. Gaia Gear's mystery and allure comes from the fact of people not knowing a whole lot about it it borderlines on slightly reused tropes here and there. That said, Gaia Gear is not without its merit. It has great mechanical designs by Mamoru Ito and more importantly, it can be seen as the final story of Char by Tomino and how, in the late 80s and early 90s, he was already thinking in the concept of the return of Char as a somewhat clone and the future evolution of Universal Century, all with its internal conflicts and factions. And if you ask me, Gaia Gear has a very Sega Gundam-like vibe. So friends, my name is Abs, and let's explore the story of Gaia Gear. And please bear with me, since this video will be more like a podcast, as there is very little reference material and actually zero video material. In the 80s, Gundam was synonymous with Universal Century, which in turn was synonymous with Tomino's writing. Mobile Suit Gundam was where everything started. Hathaway's Flash told the story of how, even at the beginning of the second century, the Universal Century was still in turmoil and humans were still in conflict. And 
since the author already probably knew that the world of Gundam was that of never-ending wars, Gaia Gear was Tomino's first attempt to portray the 3rd century of the UOC timeline. The Earth Federation was still the worst and not only that, but a Titans-like suborganization was forming with the Maha. And yes, I know that the correct pronunciation is Titans, but I'll continue to use the Japanese pronunciation Titans because it's super silly, absurd, and I kinda like it better in a Gundam context. Anyway, as I said in my previous video, Hathaway Flash and Gaia Gear share some similarities. Both protagonists are members and leaders of a rebel group that wants to end the Federation's corrupt ways. Both protagonists are related to Char, and the Earth Federation has a special organization that is doing very nasty things with Earth citizens, and they are both known as the Manhunters. Oh yeah, and they both have super bizarre mechanical designs. I may be getting way ahead of myself since I refuse to read anything about Hathaway's Flash, but I think that since Char's counterattack featured a Federation group, Londo Bell being the heroes, Tomino wanted, like in Seda, to give us the perspective of the Federation growing corrupt again, and a rebel group forming against it. For Tomino, it seems that storytelling in Universal Century works more or less like a pendulum. First, we're with the Federation against Zion. Then, we're with the rebels against the Federation. Then, we were the rebels against Neo Zion. Then, we were the Federation against the second Neo Zion. And now, we're with the rebels against the Federation. In real life, and these are not exact dates, but more like approximations, Tomino made the original Gundam in 1979. Then, the movie trilogy was done between 1981 and 1982. Zeta Gundam came in 1985, Double Zeta in 1986, Charles Counterattack in 1988, Hathaway's Flash in 1989, and Gaia Gear started in 1987. So, more or less from 1985 to 1990, Tomino wrote a lot of Universal Century. Not only what is known now as early Universal Century, but also some sequels set in the near and far future. That's probably why all of those stories share some concepts, characters, and even some mobile suits. What's more interesting with Gaia Gear is the fact that in those years, the now iconic Gundam head and overall body design was still being developed so machines could look very different from one another. That's why the Xi Gundam is so different from, say, the new Gundam, and the Gaia Gear Alpha, the main mobile suit, I'm sorry, the main man machine, is a very weird looking yet transforming mecha. It's as if the Zeta Gundam and a Valkyrie from Macross had a child. Another notable man machine is the Soaring Soul, an experimental mobile suit made by Anaheim Electronics in UC-110, that it's the direct evolution of the Sasabi. The Soaring Soul was reactivated almost a hundred years later, updated, and now bearing the name RX-110 Refined Soaring Soul is one of the coolest looking Sasabi variants ever. What I'm trying to say here is that in those 5 to 10 years, Tomino was super prolific with Gundam stories and his world building of Universal Century was groundbreaking. At first, because as we approached the 90s, he started to reuse some tropes. In fact, in Gaia Gear, he went and reused Char and Zeon as a franchi Char in the C Zeon organization, which would later become Metatron. It's very interesting how his worldview of his creation, namely Universal Century, changed so much between the years of Charles Counterattack and F91. And then everything went super dark with victory. I'm pretty sure that a lot of this has to do with his conflicts with Sunrise, the pressure of Bandai for more and more model kits and toys, and his depression. So Gaia Gear remains as the last work of Tomino's early vision of the future of Universal Century, a story that was written before his downfall with Sunrise, before the new future of the UC as told by F91 and Victory, amidst his battles with depression, and then his eventual return to the Gundam universe many years later in a more positive outlook with Turn A Gundam. But the real questions here are, has Gaia Gear aged well? Is it a story worth revisiting and incorporating to the official Universal Century? Let's find out. The 
Xeonic Scanlations has a great timeline describing the important events prior to the start of Gaia Gear. Everything begins on UC-104 when the Federation strengthens the Manhunter organization, something that also happens in Hathaway's Flesh. On UC-105, Federal forces intensify the suppression of anti-Earth Federation organization. This same year marks the start of Hathaway's Flesh story. Almost 50 years later, the Char Continuation Project is in vogue. This is a project that wants to bring back Char as the messianic figure for the Space Noids. A couple of years later, in UC-155, the Zizian, not Serazian, Zizian organization is established to oppose anti-Spesnoid Federation policies. In UC-184, the Char continuation project is successful and the memory clone of Char named Afranti Char is secretly transferred to Earth, but he doesn't know that he has inherited the memories of Casbah. Two years later, the Federation establishes the Manhunter Agency that will be referred to as the Maha. The real story of Gaia Gear starts more or less in UC-203 when the Federation rolls out the newest and most advanced Psychomo-equipped man-machine unit called the Gaia Gear Alpha. And here's where things get a little bit messy as the plots from the novel and the audio drama are different. Well, not entirely different, in the big picture they are the same, it's just that in the novel a lot more things happen especially man-machine battles. In the audio drama, everything is very much distilled in order for it to be more personal, to discover the motives behind the important characters. Man-machines do appear, but they are left pretty much in the background with not a lot of emphasis on them. Back to the plot. In both stories, a Franchi Char is detained by the Maha where he lived, in the South Pacific Environmental Conservation District. But the C organization, or Metatron, captures the Gaia Gear Alpha and uses it to break a Franchi Char out of Maha's custody. The thing is that in the audio drama, Metatron is always Metatron. We never hear about the Zizion organization. If you want to read the summary of the plot of Gaia Gear, you can go to the Gundam Wiki or even the Wikipedia page of Gaia Gear. Also, here in YouTube is the entire audio drama with good subtitling for the first 23 episodes. The last three are not so good, but you can more or less get the point. Except the last one, that probably got corrupted when uploading since it ends way too abruptly. So, as I have said in previous videos, I'm not that fond of video summaries. So, I'm going to talk about the most important plot points. A Franchi lives on an island with his girl Everly Key, who suspiciously looks a lot like Lala Sun. The Maha is aware of the Char continuation project and is actively searching for this new Char. They come across him in the island, but the Metatron organization finds him first and he displays great abilities when he pilots a man machine. Within Metatron, a Franchi is then given the information that he is in fact a memory clone of Char Asnable, the great space liberator from more than a century before, and that by going to space, he will be able to access all of those memories and skills. He decides to go to space and leave Everly behind as he doesn't want her to get involved in the war. But first, they go to Hong Kong in order to be able to fly to space aboard a spaceship. Here they fight the Maha and the French first encounters Ul Urien, the Ace Federation pilot who will soon be his nemesis. Fortunately, they can still escape from Earth into space. Up there, a Franchi realizes that now he can hear the thoughts of Char and all of a sudden, a new sense in him awakens. As his soul is no longer weighed down by gravity, his latent new type abilities can now flow freely through space, capable of hearing and feeling everyone important around him. Now in space and aboard the ship Spacious, he is greeted by the rest of the Metatron crew and is now addressed as Your Excellency Char Asnavo even though he is not Char Asnable per se. From there, they go to the Hell's Colony in order for a Franchi to get to know the life people are living in space. That even though from the outside the colonies look like a man-made paradise, they are far from it. The problem with Hellas is that it's now a Maha-secured place, so it's not so easy to move around it. Good thing is that Krishna, a girl from Metatron who has a crush with a Franchi, knows her way in there since she is from that colony. There, they meet Messer and Ray, two punks who are friends of Krishna. A riot breaks out and the Franchi gets separated from the group, meanwhile Krishna gets captured by Ul. A Franchi is then picked up by none other than Bijan Dargul, 
the commander of the space Maha. Bijan feels at ease with Franchi and pretending not to know him, the commander of the Maha goes ahead and explains his feelings about space and about Earth, that he thinks that Earth is not as polluted as everyone thinks it is and finally he reveals the Earth Reverse Immigration Plan, an initiative that wants to return every single human being to Earth. But it's okay since Messer and Ray rapidly inform Metatron that a Franchi got captured and now the Royal Organization is going to get him back. They send the Gaia gear and a Franchi fights again with Ul Urien piloting the new mecha called the Brom Texter, but a Franchi still wins. So Ul gets very angry at Metatron and a Franchi and starts to behave very brutal towards his prisoner Krishna. Anyway, now that the Earth Reverse Immigration Plan is fully known, Bijan moves in the Mahagajisu spaceship towards the Earth in order to try and convince the Earth Federation to do his bidding. Obviously, Mother Metatron, Metatron's mothership, tries to stop them from entering the Earth by sending the Earth Force One. But they fail and a Franchi aboard the Gaia Gear gets separated from the fleet. Shenanigans happen and the Maha Coup detects the Earth Federation and Bijan Dargal is now the final boss. I'm sorry! The new leader of the Federation now is fully capable of executing the Earth Reverse Immigration Plan even though the Earth is nowhere near capable of housing that many humans. His headquarters are now in Bavaria, specifically in the Neuschwanstein Castle. Oh yeah, and at some point Metatron is again attacked by the Hong Kong Maha with their new man machines called the Gids Gis and I swear to Lala that I'm not making up these names. The Gitz Geese are brutal man machines that totally outclass Metatron's man machines and even a Franchi with his fin funnels and Saikomu finds it hard to contain them so the Air Force One requests backup from Mother Metatron. But in something that I didn't expect and I definitely won't spoil, they don't help. Now it's up to the basic forces of the Earth-stranded Metatron to finish the Manhunter Agency and then the audio drama abruptly ends and I don't know what happens next. I'm sorry to do that to you but I couldn't find the ending of the original audio drama, well the translated ending anyway. The novel is much more ambitious in its scope and has a lot of battles throughout Europe and the Franchi gets to destroy Bijan Dargle and escape with Everly to live happily ever after or something like that. So yeah, that's that. Thank you very much for staying until the end of the video. My name is Absa and <laughs> no, 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 I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. Of course, I have more things to say, just not about the story. Back to BJ's tweet, the story of Gaia Gear is in some ways similar to Sarah Gundam and I can't really say how much more in common it has with Hatsa with Flash as I haven't read it and I don't want to read the summary. But yeah, the story bits are things that we already saw in previous UC stories, except the part of what happens with Mother Metatron, or well, at least what happens in the audio drama. But do I think that it can be added to late Universal Century? Definitely just with a lot of tweaks. As I said before, the mechanical design is amazing. I really liked the refined soaring soul and the brown texture. And well, we know for a fact that any story that involves Char will be greatly appreciated by Gundam fans, especially one where he is the main protagonist and pilots the main mobile suits, as seen in the origin. The concept of the Manhunter Agency is something that has already appeared in other media from Unicorn to Hathaway Flash, so that scene has already been planted. Also, in Gundam narrative, we learn about the second coming of Char project or something like that, that was in fact creating Char clones and Sultan was a failed one. So again, the seed for an eventual return of Char has been planted canonically. Another super cool thing is that the Gaia gear and the Brom texture are equipped with Saikom and that can easily be retconned to be Psycho Frame, making the triumphal return of Psycho Frame equipped mobile suits. So yeah, for me, Gaia Gear's story is ripe with great concepts that, if used correctly, could make the ultimate late Universal Century tale. A great fan service send-off with a good Char clone, the return of another Sionic organization, and the rediscovery of Psycho Frame tech. Hell, if you already had Mobile Suit Gundam The Origin, the advent of the Red Comet, 
This can even be called Mobile Suit Gundam, the ending, the Red Comet's final return. The thing is that it may be too soon to again be messing with Char clones, Xeon and Psycho Frame. Gundam narratives PTSD still haunts us. Now, well, I don't know. I wish I could say that the story of Gaia Gear is as good as it is, but at least for the audio drama, it feels weird. I know that it's a Gundam setting, but it feels not at all connected. Unicorn did a great job in capturing all the nostalgia and story elements that made it feel connected to early Universal Century story, even though it was written way, way later. Gaia Gear doesn't have that, and that probably was by design, as it was not an official story. Sunrise can definitely adapt it, maybe even go the same route as the Origin or Unicorn by releasing it as OVAs, but they need to change a lot of stuff so that it feels more cohesive and linked to the overall Universal Century Gundam's Chronicle. But man, hopefully they do something about it, because imagine an HG or even an MG kit of the Gaia Gear Alpha or the Brom Texture, definitely the refined Soaring Soul needs one. Their level of engineering now is totally up to par, so that would be amazing. But yeah, we can only dream and I definitely invite you to go check out the summary or even the audio drama of Gaia Gear. It's a very conceptually interesting piece of obscure Gundam media that not many know of, and a story that we may never get to experience in another more modern way. This video marks the end of the original conception and ideas for Tomino's early vision of Universal Century's timeline, except well, when I returned for the exploration of the second movie of the Hathaway trilogy. I decided to talk about this story after Hathaway's Flash and before Formula 91 because I felt that Gaia Gear is much more in line with Tomino's early thought that every Gundam protagonist had to have some sort of connection to a previous storyline. With F91, that got completely discarded as he intentionally started from scratch. Kinda, as F91 was still vaguely connected to the early stories and some previous themes were still kept. F91 is a very, very weird show, not because of what happens in the movie, but because of what happens outside as it was first conceived as a long series, but then it got axed and only some parts of the story were actually present in the movie. Then there's a crossbone manga, also from Tomino's mind, that expanded the story a lot, but it was set 10 years after the event, so it's complicated. In fact, all of the late Universal Century saga is complicated, very complicated. Anyway, I hope you liked my way of explaining and analyzing the existence of Gaia Gear and I know that I missed tons of interesting points, so please tell me in the comments what are your thoughts of this not Gundam story written by Kilemol Tomino. And as you may or may not know, my name is Absol, and we'll continue the conversation over at Twitter, where you can follow me at Absolonicas, and on Instagram, where I post pictures of my figures, my cats, and sometimes even myself. I'll be trying to talk more about anime, comics, and maybe even figures. Until next time, always remember that in fiction lies power, so let's use it to forge a new type of story, our hero's journey.